The New Orleans Saints have done a fantastic job swinging for the fences when it comes to their open offensive coordinator search, but one of my top candidates still has some things to prove before he can be the next OC. We got all of that and a little bit of land yet for you on today's episode of Locked on Saints. You are Locked on Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Houdat Nation and Houdat family? I am your host, Ross Jackson, your New Orleans Saints expert, credential member of the media covering the New Orleans Saints as the senior writer and reporter over at Saints News Network. And on today's episode of Locked on Saints, we're going to answer the question, are the New Orleans Saints taking too long in their offensive coordinator search? What's the risk and what's the timeline actually looking like? We're going to break all that down. Also give you some more updates, including a top candidate that could be on his way elsewhere for the New Orleans Saints offensive coordinator job. And to kick us all off, we're going to take a look at Clint Kubiak, now named as one of the other interview guys for the New Orleans Saints, one of those candidates, and why he's got something to prove coming from San Francisco after a year before he should be the New Orleans Saints offensive coordinator. We've got all that coming up for you today. We appreciate you, as always, for making Locked on Saints your first listen of the day every day for being an everyday or here on the show as a part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked on Saints is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash Locked on NFL and enter the promo code Locked on NFL in all lowercase for a first deposit match up to $100. So plain and simple, the New Orleans Saints are not messing around when it comes to their offensive coordinator search. Two more top candidates added to the New Orleans Saints list with San Francisco 49ers passing game coordinator Clint Kubiak and San Francisco 49ers quarterback coach and former NFL quarterback Brian Greasy. But I want to focus first on Clint Kubiak. Clint Kubiak, as well as the quarterback coach and passing game coordinator for the Los Angeles Rams, Zach Robinson have consistently been my number one candidates for the Saints offensive coordinator position so far. But when it comes to Clint Kubiak, he's got something very important to prove during his interview process before the New Orleans Saints should hire him. Let's break it down. So you look back at Clint Kubiak and what his experience is. He's that quarterback coach with the San Francisco 49ers, or excuse me, uh, pass game coordinator for the San Francisco 49ers last year. The year before that, he was the quarterback coach and passing game coordinator for the Denver Broncos, working with the Nathaniel Hackett's of the world, uh, but also getting to work with Russell Wilson during that time. And even before that, going back to the 2021 season, he was an active offensive coordinator and play caller in the NFL for the Minnesota Vikings. If you just look over the numbers, which is one of the reasons why he's been one of my top candidates, he helped Justin Jefferson, the a uh, former LSU wide receiver, the Minnesota Vikings wide receiver on his way to 1,616 receiving yards and 10 touchdowns. Very impressive performance for uh, Justin Jefferson. Kirk Cousins, who's always been one of those super chaotic quarterbacks. You never necessarily know what you're going to get out of him. Well, 4,221 passing yards, uh, 33 passing touchdowns, and just seven interceptions. So took care of the football, got the ball downfield, and scored right got the ball in the end zone so you look at those two numbers and you think okay you give him Chris Olave and then you give him uh you know Derek Carr who's a little bit more of a predictable quarterback I think is safe to say and there's intrigue there at the very least he's got the play calling experience and he's the only candidate actually on the Saints interview list that can say that at the NFL regular season level as a full-time play caller outside of Shane Waldron, who's now the head coach, or excuse me, that's who's now over with the Chicago Bears. So he's off the list. So why, why has this move, why did the move from Minnesota happen? If everything was all roses and rainbows, why did he end up leaving Minnesota? So this is one of those ones that you look at like Ryan Nielsen across the division, right? Ryan Nielsen, had a head coach that hired him, and Arthur Smith. Arthur Smith gets canned. Ryan Nielsen heads over the Jacksonville Jaguars. Thank goodness if you're the New Orleans Saints. Bye. I love not having him in the division anymore with an intimate knowledge of what it is you want to do on both the offensive and defensive sides of the football. That's good news. Uh, but 
Much like that, you saw the same thing for Clint Kubiak. Once Mike Zimmer and Gary Kubiak were no longer in Minnesota, it gave Clint Kubiak the sort of kick out of Minnesota as well. The guy that brought him there was no longer there, so he ends up moving, but didn't stay as an offensive coordinator. Why? The actual reason here is that he struggled as a play caller. So if he struggled, Ross, why is he your number one candidate? I'll get to that in just a moment, but let's talk about how he struggled first. Mostly, it was because he was green. He was a first-time play caller, 35, 34 years old at the time. Um, he kind of just simply took Gary Kubiak's offense, and then instead of really adding his own stuff to it, just really kind of focused on the sequencing, they were one of those sort of, who's another good example out there, the Cleveland Browns, right? You got six really, really good plays, right? You got a selection of six to 10 really, really good plays, and those are the plays that you run. Go out there and get it done, right? Think about the um, Los Angeles Rams and their duo run, which we broke down before that Thursday night game, for instance, right? Uh, so that's kind of what that playbook was, and his job was to focus on sequencing, but he wasn't using his system. He was using someone else's system. So then what ends up becoming the disconnect is, do you understand the why of your play calling? Are you calling this against this coverage? And if so, why? Are you calling this, uh, let's say you're calling a bootleg after an outside zone, why, right? What's the why behind all of it? And then the diversity of plays was an issue, things like that. So the big question is, did he grow during his season in San Francisco? And I feel very positive around that idea, right? I believe that, yeah, if you're a guy that shows up and you know that you have some things to improve upon when it comes to your offensive system and your offensive play calling, going from a place that lacked diversity of, uh, of play selection, going to a place that the sequencing was an issue, things like that, to a place where there is no such thing as a lack of diversity in the offense, it changes your perspective. So this is why the interview process becomes so important because it's very hard to believe that Clint Kubiak walked out of his experience as a first-time play caller, a little bit too young, right, uh, in Minnesota and goes, you know what? In three years, that exact same thing is going to work somewhere else. Zero shot that that's what he walked out thinking, considering it wasn't his system in the first place. So then he shows up, he starts working with Kyle Shanahan, he starts working with some of these you know, key play callers. You saw Mike, well, I guess he didn't overlap with Mike McDaniel, but you know, you see Mike McDaniel leave that program. You see Bobby Slowick leave that program and the success that they've had. Now you slot in to the same role that they just had and think that it's not going to have a positive effect on you. A hundred percent, it's going to have a positive effect on you. I've been speaking to folks that are within, around, cover the Vikings, and a lot of people seem to believe that it is very, very possible and that the expectation is indeed that he made the growth that would have been beneficial for him in Minnesota at that time. So the mistakes that you saw in Minnesota, it feels like all the people with the intimate knowledge of it don't believe that he'll make those same mistakes again. But it is still a good reminder that we shouldn't always go by the numbers. The numbers say that there's some potential there, but then understanding the context lets you know what it is that needs to be worked on. This is why the interview process is going to be so important. And the reason why I'm confident about a Clint Kubiak, the reason why I still, despite all that, feel that he should be one of the two number one candidates, 1A, 1B, however you want to look at it, along with Zach Robinson for the New Orleans Saints, is because of working with a guy like Kyle Shanahan. Knowing what doesn't work in the NFL, knowing what doesn't work in that system, now knowing the why behind all that, what will work, and the why behind all that, all that he has to do now is prove that in the interview process. It's very important for Kubiak and the Saints to really mine this point. If he goes in with the Gary Kubiak playbook, Clint Kubiak should be shown the door. That simple. But if he shows up with his Shanahan playbook or with Shanahan's playbook and a much better understanding of why you're doing things like running that bootleg after running an outside zone and why you do it versus this coverage and this coverage and why it works here versus why it works there or why it doesn't work here versus why it doesn't work there. And he's got a more expansive understanding of his play selection and a more expansive understanding of his ability as a play caller, then let's party. It's Clint Kubiak time here in New Orleans. So I do think that Clint Kubiak, along with Zach Robinson, are great hires for the New Orleans Saints. But for both, you kind of have to make a little bit of a leap, a little bit of a hurdle, a little bit of a leap of faith. And Clint Kubiak, did he truly improve from what you saw in Minnesota? Interview will help you with that. Zach Robinson, can he become a first-time play caller and not be what Clint Kubiak was when he was too young in Minnesota? 
interview will have to prove that. So this is on the New Orleans Saints to make the right decision and trust what they're being shown. But I am still very, very confident in Clint Kubiak as well as Zach Robinson to be guys that can really, really help take this New Orleans Saints offense in the right direction in the much needed improvement that it needs. All right, we got much, much more for you. We still got to talk Brian Greasy. And we're also going to take a look at how the New Orleans Saints could potentially fall behind here and lose out on one of their top candidates if they're not careful. Got that coming up for you as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked on Saints is brought to you by friends at Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy sports made easy, the most fun and exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. It's certainly the most fun way that I've had winning up to 25 times my money back by simply picking two or more players, choosing up against those prize picks projections, whether or not they're going to come in at more or less than those projections, and then sitting back because my entry's all done. Yeah, it's that simple. And they've got a bunch of fun stuff that you can do too, including competing against guys like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz in their community plays under the promos tab of the app. There's a whole bunch of really cool stuff going on here, including your ability to be able to mesh sports and, of course, participate across a ton of different sports as well. So go and check them out today. Seriously, the most fun you're going to have playing daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL and enter the promo code locked on NFL for a first deposit match up to $100. The first deposit match up to $100. Prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL. Promo code locked on NFL. Prizepicks daily fantasy sports made easy. All right, family, if the New Orleans Saints want to land one of their top offensive coordinator candidates, they might need to act faster than they seem to be ready to. We got that coming up for you today on today's episode of Locked on Saints. We appreciate you very much for being an everydayer here on the show. Don't forget to go and check out the Locked on Sports YouTube stream, the 24-7 National sports media stream, the first ever of its kind over on YouTube. You can find it by heading over to Locked On Sports today on YouTube and subscribe and go ahead and be a part of history. So look, if the New Orleans Saints want to be able to lock up a guy like Dan Pitcher, somebody that was on the initial interview list that broke alongside names like um, you know, Shane Waldron, who's already been hired away, as well as of course Zach Robinson, who's you know doing other interviews and everything. They might need to act faster than the New Orleans Saints are willing to do. I asked Mickey Loomis during his end of year press conference, how, what's the timeline that you expect when it comes to finding your new offensive coordinator? And he went into detail about how he believes that one of the biggest mistakes that NFL teams make is rushing into a decision like this and therefore ending up with the wrong guy. They want to take their time, mine the information, figure things out. We're going to break down that timeline here in a little bit, like some of the benchmarks in terms of like, hey, at this point, you're too late, like that kind of stuff. But one of the things that's always going to sort of be the measure of lateness or the measure of timeliness in many people's minds is, well, does one of the guys that was on your interview list end up getting a job somewhere else? And that could happen here with a Dan Pitcher, who's currently the quarterback coach of the Cincinnati Bengals. Remember, Cincinnati Bengals offensive coordinator just got hired away to the Tennessee Titans as their new head coach and Brian Callahan. And listen, Tennessee Titans fans are very, very excited about that hire. And I'm sure Dan Pitcher is as well. He spent a lot of time with the Cincinnati Bengals. And now there's an opportunity that he could potentially be tapped as the guy that moves up to the offensive coordinator spot as an in-house hire. And boom, he ain't got to do much else. He ain't got to do a lot of nothing outside of that. Now, Cincinnati's got to undergo an entire process. They have to bring in at least one external minority candidate, all this other stuff. Like they still have to conduct a lot of different things and conduct in earnest other interviews. But Dan Pitcher right now, you have to imagine, has the inside track to that job. And it doesn't stop there. Dan Pitcher was also one of those guys that was kind of brought in and, and, and did a lot of work with Marvin Jones. Marvin Jones right now is working with the coaching staff over in Las Vegas with newly appointed and interim tag removed head coach Antonio Pierce. Guess who else is looking for an offensive coordinator? For their team, that would be Antonio Pierce, Marvin Jones, and the Las Vegas Raiders. So that's another place where a guy like Dan Pitcher could end up landing. Now, Dan Pitcher is supposed to do his next and second interview with the New Orleans Saints on Thursday. So that does give them a timeline and an expectation. My understanding is that he is going to be meeting with the Saints in person for that. They already conducted 
a virtual interview. They've conducted interviews with a bunch of different candidates, it, as it turns out. Uh, so we're learning more about all that. But look, the, the, the thing that you have to watch out for here is, you know, what, look at the other opportunities that are out there. Can you compete with those other opportunities in the first place? And also, what's your timeline and how does your timeline match up with maybe other teams' timelines and, of course, that candidate's timeline? So Dan Pitcher, definitely one to watch for when it comes to the other opportunities around the New Orleans Saints. If the Saints like them, they got to find a way to get it done if that's who they want as their offensive coordinator. And that's another thing that I will mention. If you watch a guy end up landing somewhere else, like a Shane Waldron, who chose the Chicago Bears, who are very likely to draft Caleb Williams over the New Orleans Saints after just one interview, that kind of makes perfect sense. So sometimes there are things that you inherently can't compete with, right? Because you're not one of the worst teams in the NFL, no matter who would have you believe that. And then there are other times where maybe that's just not the guy that this team wanted. So we'll have to see exactly which way that goes. So I want to circle back now to um, to Brian Greasy, another guy that the Saints have requested to interview. He's the quarterback coach, or is rather the quarterback coach for the San Francisco 49ers. 2022, 2023, that was his first coaching gig. So this is really still in the midst of his first stint in coaching. But hey, 10 years as an NFL quarterback doesn't mean nothing, that's for sure. So it might be a little bit too early, I think, for a guy like Brian Greasy to maybe step into a play calling role, a la Clint Kubiak over with the Minnesota Vikings. Um, And while I do think that former quarterbacks becoming coordinators does make a little bit of sense. There were a lot of people who were throwing around the idea of like, why doesn't Drew Brees come and be the offensive coordinator for the New Orleans Saints? If I'm Drew Brees, I'm saying as far away from that idea as possible. My legacy is built in New Orleans. I'm not about to go and become an offensive coordinator, do something I've never done before in my entire life, and then go crash, crash, burn, bang in like two, three years, and all of a sudden my legacy in that city is ruined? Uh Uh-uh, you ain't seen me do nothing in a city of New Orleans around the game of football, except for my legendary playing experience in time. That's it. That's what you get from me. And you'll, and, and you'll like it. And you'll like it. That's the way that I'm looking at that if I'm Drew Brees. But when it comes to a guy like Brian Greasy, like I get it. Like I see the appeal outside of being tied, you know, so tightly to the organization like a Drew Brees is uh, of seeing like where a quarterback becoming an offensive coordinator comes in. But I don't necessarily know if that's what the Brian Greasy interview is about. Let me take you back to a long time ago. 10 minutes, maybe seven minutes ago, uh, where we discussed the Clint Kubiak situation, right? How much has Clint Kubiak grown? You know, a really good way to find that out is to ask people around him, you know, who's been around him? Brian Greasy. So I don't think that it's a coincidence, a quinky dink, if you will, uh, at all that they requested to speak to not only Clint Kubiak, but also Brian Greasy, much like how the Chicago Bears requested to speak to Cliff Kingsbury when we all know and what about to hire no Cliff Kingsbury as their offensive coordinator, but they were about to draft a Caleb Williams, so there's your scouting interview. Could Brian Greasy, with all respect to him, not only be a candidate, right? Let me show him the respect that he deserves, not only be a true candidate, but could he also be a part of the Saints vetting Clint Kubiak? Something to watch out for, because there's no other comparison of that with any of the other candidates that we have seen or heard be interviewed or requested so far this year. So it could be the New Orleans Saints getting a little up close and personal look at Clint Kubiak through the eyes of somebody who has literally been up close and personal with his development and with his growth. All right. I want to take a look now before we wrap this up at one more interview to get you Ronald Curry, New Orleans Saints quarterback coach, passing game coordinator. No surprise here. Got the look. According to Joe, uh, Joe Siner, Joe. Oh my gosh. Josina Anderson, my apologies. According to Josina Anderson, he was interviewed last week, so they've gotten a little bit of a look at him. I also do think, too, that this kind of gives you a little bit of an interesting look at sort of the timeline so far that the New Orleans Saints have done their in-house look. They've done their external looks. They've kind of looked at a lot of different types of candidates from the Gerard Johnsons to the Zach Robinsons to the Clint Kubiaks and beyond. And of course, got to look at their in-house guy. And now they're already on to second interviews. Maybe things are going to move a little bit more quickly than we thought. And we know that when it comes to Ronald Curry, he's somebody that deserves an opportunity as an offensive coordinator in the NFL. He's been a rising star in coaching circles for a long time now. He has risen like crazy through the ranks when it comes to the New Orleans Saints 
coaching staff, wide receivers up to quarter, well, offensive assistants up to wide receivers up to quarterbacks now into the passing game coordinator situation, now getting looked at over the course of that would be now three years straight that he's been looked at as an offensive coordinator, whether it be in New Orleans or elsewhere. So we know that he absolutely deserves this look. So definitely something to watch out for. It would be really interesting though, almost like a little bit of a cell phone if the New Orleans Saints were to land on Ronald Curry being the right guy and then he balls out with this team in 2023 and it just sits, makes you sit back and wonder, man, what could 2022 have been if the Saints would have just turned over play calling duties a little, well, not a little bit sooner, but much, much sooner when it felt like they should have partway through the 2023 season. Sorry, I said 2022, but maybe that's right as well. Who knows? Uh, all right, coming up next, we are still not done here. What about the timeline for the New Orleans Saints? Where do we really look at and go, okay, the Saints are too late when it comes to making the decision? We got that coming up for you as we continue on and wrap up today's episode of Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked on Saints is brought to you by our friends at eBay Motors. Passion, drive, patience. What brings home a winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything that you need to be able to maintain your vehicle and even level it up to its peak performance from superchargers to LED headlights to exhaust kits and much, much more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what it is that you're looking for and with eBay's guaranteed fit, the part is guaranteed to fit the first time, every time, or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. So with all the parts that you need at the prices that you want, it's easy to turn your car into an MVP and, of course, bring home that big dub. So keep your ride or die alive today at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit available only to U.S. customers. Let's get it, Houdat Nation. Are the New Orleans Saints taking too long to hire their offensive coordinator? And at what point do we kind of look at the benchmark of what is too long for this search? Don't forget, we are your team every day. Make sure you come back tomorrow for the latest on the continuing developing coaching searches when it comes to the New Orleans Saints offensive coordinator. What are some options at other uh, pieces when it comes to some of the other vacancies that they had? More coaching changes that could be on the way. We got you all covered here on the Locked On Saints podcast every single Monday through Friday. And then some, you know how it goes, a little bit of land yap. And just a reminder, land yap, for those that don't know, means a little something extra. My little way of saying all that and more. All right. So um, are these things taking too long? The answer right now is unequivocally no, right? Not a lot of OCs have been hired across the NFL. The one candidate that they wanted, the one candidate that they did an interview with that did get hired was a guy, Shane Waldron. And maybe because of my bias, because of him being a little bit lower on the list, he would have been beneath guys like Zach Robinson, Clint Kubiak, and Gerard Johnson, in my opinion, on my list. Maybe I'm just looking at it and going, eh. But like if Shane Waldron was your favorite candidate, then yes, the New Orleans Saints were too late, right? They were too late for your favorite candidate in that case. But are they too late? In their offensive coordinator search, are they taking too much time in their offensive coordinator search? No. They're effectively taking the same amount of time that every other team is taking. And with so many head coaching positions still being available, the Chargers, the Falcons, the Commanders, so much more, um, those kinds of pieces are going to fall into place first, as well as other teams that have open GM spots and things like that too. So, so you would expect all of those other sort of like larger dominoes to fall before the coordinator stuff begins to fall. So the Saints are still in good position. And let's keep it real too, like there's a lot of potential head coaches that might not get the head coaching job that might be looking to land as offensive coordinator. So there are still, there's still that pool of uh, candidates that could become available. And on top of that, there's still a lot of guys that aren't going to commit to a job right away in all cases. Shane Waldron, again, an exception, number one overall selection in the NFL draft, very likely get an opportunity to coach a generational prospect who can break the NFL like a Caleb Williams. Yeah, you say yes to that job the moment that it comes up. But in other cases, you're like, okay, well, wait, who's going to land in Los Angeles? Who's going to land in Atlanta? Do I want to work with that guy? Do I want to work with that guy? All that kind of stuff. So those pieces could potentially end up being there. Now, 
The Saints probably haven't gotten to the end of their list either. And one thing, Saints have the opportunity to do the funniest thing in the world and request an interview with, or I guess they don't have to request, but schedule an interview with one Arthur Smith, who they effectively got canned at the end of the season. And of course, the entire shouting match after the game and Dennis Allen apologizing, all those things could be hysterical, but I don't think that the New Orleans Saints go that way. Although there are reports out there saying that there are at least seven teams interested in Arthur Smith as their next offensive coordinator. So who knows? I hope the New Orleans Saints are not on that list because if they had trouble utilizing playmakers last year, eh, Arthur Smith ain't going to fix that problem for you. So when we look at what the timeline for the New Orleans Saints really is, as I mentioned last week when we spoke with Mickey Loomis, he basically told me they want to take their time. They want to be calculatory all throughout this. So what's the timeline that you're operating with? Well, on Sunday, I start my drive to Mobile, Alabama for the Senior Bowl. Senior Bowl is a good place to either put pen to paper, right? Because you've done the second interviews. This is a time where people are all in the same place. Think about it the same way as you know, a rookie not signing his a rookie deal until training camp happens with at least one prospect every year that everyone always asks about across every team because no one pays attention to what hap what's happening with the other teams. And so when that happens, everybody kind of goes, well, why is it happening? It's because literally that player and that team are not in the same place at the same time until training camp. That's it. That's usually the case. <laughs> And so you could do the same thing at the Senior Bowl. Senior Bowl is an opportune time for all of a sudden some piece of news to hit like, oh, the Saints are hiring this coach. The Saints are hiring that coach. The other thing that you could do is get ahead of the Senior Bowl, have your offensive coordinator so that when you travel to the Senior Bowl, your offensive coordinator is starting to meet and start to pick the brains and go, you know what? We have a wide receiver coach position open. Let me go chat with this guy that I really know and this guy that I really like and this guy that I have a previous existing relationship with. You know, we really need, we, you know, there's a running back coach uh, position open. Let me let me go talk to this player that worked with this coach that I know of that I think really highly of, but this player actually worked with him. Hey, what was your experience like with it? You know what I mean? It, it becomes an opportunity for your offensive coordinator to do some more of that recruiting himself, to fill out the rest of the positions of your offensive staff. So getting ahead of the senior bowl helps you be able to do that. I personally think the too late becomes when you're trying to rustle together that staff whether it's the offensive coordinator or you make the offensive coordinator hire so late that it impacts your ability to get the rest of the assistants filled out before the combine. That's where I think you go, ooh, like too late, way too late in that case. So for me, that's, that's where you get to the too late. Then, then the other too late is a moving target, right? If you, Zach Robinson, Clint Kubiak, my number one targets, if Zach Robinson's the number one target for the New Orleans Saints and he takes the offensive coordinator position with another organization, let's just throw one out there. Let's just say the Las Vegas Raiders. Um, then yeah, you were too late. You were too late. If that was your number one target and he went out and high, got signed with somebody else or, or, or hired by somebody else before you got an opportunity to get a second interview in or you got the opportunity to get an offer in or something like that, then yeah, you were too late. But we have to remember that these coordinator candidates want to try to get as many irons in the fire as possible. Oh, well, yeah, I, these two, I've got these three organizations that have offers in on me. Like I've done, I've played this game before, especially when you're in a union and all these other things, like play this game before. Oh, well, this, this theater wants to pay me this much. This theater wants to pay me that much. You're offering to pay me that much. I really want to do this, but you can see like, you're coming in a little low here. Can you match one of them? And then boom, we're Gucci. Like, yeah. You have to do this sometimes. So, so let's not forget that it's not just the saints that are interviewing candidates, but the candidates are interviewing organizations. And the candidates want their opportunity to be able to land in an organization where maybe there's advancement available, where maybe there's you know a, a, a system that's already in place. That's not what you're going to want here in New Orleans. You want to bring your system here. But you know how is the organization? Is the organization loyal? Maybe to a fault when it comes to New Orleans sometimes. So I think that there's enough of those sort of like little bits and bobs that are all about the candidate and not necessarily about the hiring party that we have to keep in mind that it's not just like the candidate floats around not knowing what they want until a team makes an offer. No, 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 that's not the case. Candidate has just as much a part of it. Like anytime that you walk into a job interview, you're not, they're not just trying to solve your problem because you need a job. You're trying to solve their problem because they need to hire somebody to that position. Same thing goes for these candidates and the same thing goes for these coordinators and stuff like that. So I, I don't think that the Saints are behind the eight ball yet, but they could get behind the eight ball if they don't get a second interview in by the time that this candidate heads over to this place or takes you know a deal here or, or, or gets hired there or whatever. And it's not that they get hired, it's that they agree upon employment. 
Not only do they get an offer, they have to say yes. It's not just like somebody slaps in the back of the head and says, you're the Raiders guy now. It doesn't work that way, right? Like they have to say yes as well. So what made them not say yes to you? What made them say yes to somebody else? Is it because you didn't get an interview with them? Is it because you didn't get to them in time? Or is it because their opportunity was better than yours? Sometimes it's the latter, but you can't ever let it be the former. And because the New Orleans Saints have already conducted a bunch of interviews, we just didn't know about them. It's clear that they've already conducted a bunch of interviews. They've already talked to the Zach Robinsons. They've already talked to the Ronald Currys. They've already talked to you know, the Dan Pitchers. And then they've scheduled second interviews with those guys. They're bringing in more guys like Clint Kubiak and Brian Greasy. And trust me, the other candidates see that. The other candidates see them going, oh, that's another top candidate. They know that they're top candidates in these conversations. You got to play the game a little bit. So I don't think the Saints are behind the eight ball just yet. But boy, you'd love to hear either that they've come to an agreement or agreed to terms with somebody or, you know, as they get uh, before they go to the senior bowl or as they get to the senior bowl. That way you have that OC and you're scouting with your new system, especially in a situation like this where you're bringing in a new system. You want that system in place before you start looking at some of these college prospects. So that becomes the most important thing for me. Can you do that? And we'll see what happens when it comes to the New Orleans Saints. All right. We appreciate you very much making Locked on Saints your first listen of the day every day for your second listen. You know what to do. Go and check out Locked on Pelicans with Jake Madison, Locked on LSU with Caroline Fenton to get everything you need to know about those New Orleans Pelicans and those LSU Tigers. And we'll be right back here with you tomorrow. Appreciate you as always making us a part of your day, part of your routine for saying yes to me and the show. As always, if you see me, please say hi. And if you need anything else around your New Orleans Saints in between these episodes, make sure you follow me on your favorite social media at Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you live and let me know how you mom and them. And trust you, that nation, I'll holla at you.